So um, I'm on the board of directors for the League of Women Voters of Golden Valley. And on behalf of our league, we'd like to welcome all of you. Um, this is our September program on charter schools. And uh, it is co-sponsored by both League of Women Voters Golden Valley and St. Louis Park. Um, the League of Women Voters of Minnesota does not have a position on charter schools. This program is our first program here on charter schools. We're going to be hearing from proponents and those who are opposed, but this is not a debate. It's really more of an informational program so that you can learn more about charter schools and you can learn about the impact on the public schools as well. Um, you also may have noticed that the Star Tribune has had a lot of articles mm -hmm. on the on charter schools and their impact for Minneapolis St. Paul, as well as the suburban schools. Each of the panelists are going to have 10 minutes to speak. And except for our last two, Abigail and Aisha will be sharing um, about 10 minutes. They, we were told they work as a team. So thank you so much for coming. Um, so that is it. We are being uh, recorded by CCX Media for taping. And I'm going to pass this over to Jillian Rosenquist, who um, got all the speakers for us. And thank you, Jillian, for doing that. Thanks, Lee, for doing this. Um, and I want to go and give you a little bit of information of each one of our speakers. And I want to thank them very deeply for taking time out of their very busy schedules uh, to educate us about what charter schools are um, and, and what's going on in education in general and, um, and the impact on charter schools. And I'm sure we'll probably discuss some things that have come up in the Star Tribune articles as well. So please ask a lot of questions. Uh, first of all, um, Ember Reichgott Young. She uh, knows this area well. Um, she's the author of Minnesota's First in Nation Chartered School Law and the author of Zero Chance of Passage, The Pioneering Charter School Story. Um, she served in the Minnesota Senate from 1983 to 2000, and I think you represented uh, Senate District 45. And she's currently a nonprofit speaker, trainer, and consultant. Carrie Bakken is a teacher and co-founder of the Avalon Charter School. Uh, she has a master's in education and law degree from the Hamlin School of Law, which is now Mitchell Hamlin. <laughs> um, Erica goodman stroll is the board chair of Agamim mm. uh, Charter School in Hopkins. Um, and she's the parent of a school, of a student in the school. She is an adjunct professor at the William Mitchell College of Law. Sorry, now that's an old habit, uh, now Mitchell Hamlin. <laughs> um, she has worked in a, as an attorney in private practice for over a decade um, for the Anoka County De Public Defender's Office and clerked at the Minnesota Court of Appeals. John Vento is the vice chair of the Robbinsdale School Board and has been on the board for five years. Vento is also the parent of two schools in the uh, two students in the uh, Robbinsdale schools, and he works professionally as a sales manager. Um, Abigail Romblowski is a PhD candidate in, in the English Education Teaching Specialist and Licensure Program Lead and Instructor at the University of Minnesota's College of Education and Human Development. She spent 15 years as a public school teacher in an urban setting and is a Robbinsdale School parent, right? Correct. Aisha Mustafa is a Robbinsdale School parent and um, assistant at Sonison Elementary. Um, she is also a parent of Robbinsdale School students. Um, and we thank you again very much, and uh, we'll get started. We're going to begin with a video that was sent to us by Carrie Bakken. And uh, once I start it, you're going to recognize two faces, so we'll see whether you were paying attention. Uh, let me just get this started. Go possibly law school, possibly something political. There's a new job I think of every day that I'm like, oh, actually, that could be fun. Ultimately, I want to be a judge, but um, obviously I have to become a lawyer, go to law school first, get the hang of that. I'm interested in so many things, uh, which I think is great, because that just means I have so many more options. Anything that had to do with inventing, that's what I want to do. I wanted to sit in a shop and just create stuff and then go to a group of people and be like, here's what I made, do you guys want to invest in it? Chartering is a verb, it's not a school. Most children couldn't go across town and find another school even though they had access to it. So that's how chartering came about, to provide more opportunities for children in their own neighborhood. You can never have too many ideas to improve personalized learning. That's where teachers get to shine. You could call it like a democratic school, project-based, teacher-led, or at Avalon, we run the entire aspect of the school, so there is no principal, and we do all of our budgeting. We are the majority on the school board. We do all our peer review, our personnel, you know, any aspect of running the school. 
We're um, 200 students and it's grades 6 through 12. We have about 35 to 40 percent of students in special education because of the highly individualized model. We're probably about 75 to 80 percent white. We also have a high population of student, L, the LGBT community and transgender students. For the high school, it's more like a typical college student where they might have a couple classes, but then the rest of their day, um, they're doing work for their classes or in their projects. They have a lot of freedom and they get to decide. They get to look at all the state standards that are required. They look at everything that they need to do and they get to decide, do they want to take a class in that? Do they want to do a project in that? So they get to figure that out with support, <laughs> with a lot of support. Yeah, you just go throw it in there anywhere. Hold on, watch Randall get it in two seconds. My senior project is working with wood and metal. I have a giant log of white ash, and what I wanted to do as my end goal was to create a bench out of it. I went to a lot of different schools, and that did not, not work for me. But then there was also no support in terms of what you were learning. Like, you'd be in a class, and if you were lost, or if you'd be behind a bit, no one would help you. What works for me is me being able to tell my advisors and my teachers, hey, this is what I'm interested in, and I want to learn things, and I want to be in a lab and experiment with stuff. I want to build rockets, and, uh, and I, they were allowed me to do that. The interest base keeps them motivated. You find a lot of the students who are the most disengaged, they just haven't felt connected about why does this matter. Tell me why this way of learning, where I haven't been validated all these years, is the best way. When we first worked on the charter school bill back in 1991, we were really only looking for more opportunities for Minnesota children. We never thought that there would be a whole new sector called the charter sector. Minnesota, of course, is very different. We don't have very many charter networks because that is not what the original vision was. We started this thinking we were going to create schools new. There weren't going to be networks. But you see, a good idea is always built upon, right? And so in other states, things started to, to emerge that way. So Alliance College Ready Public Schools is a charter network of free public schools in the Los Angeles area. We will have 28 middle and high schools serving just over 12,000 low-income students. We are the largest charter network in the city, and I think we may actually still be the largest in the state. And we're larger, I think, than 75% of all the school systems in the state of California. Every year, 91 to 93% of our students graduate from high school is with a college-ready curriculum is pretty significant, and we're really proud of that. There's a common belief with everybody here, whether you're a student, um, teacher, administrator, office staff, that uh, although we put in longer days, longer times, and, and more during the school year than, say, some of the neighboring schools, um, the results of doing all that are really paying off and benefiting the students. We are a college-ready school, so upon enrollment in ninth grade, the big message that we send out to parents is that our mission is to get your child to graduate high school and into a college. That is our top priority. For my family in general, like my cousins, I'm the first one to actually go to college and like experience everything like I guess college life because it's kind of like scary because I don't want to let down my family like I know I'm capable of it but I guess the pressure is like oh, what if I mess up I feel like in the back of your head you're always thinking about college this high school prepares you for it so I feel like I wouldn't end up in the same place that I am today so the challenge for charters as they've grown is can you do it in a way that you don't turn into a large bureaucratic institution. Um, and you got to battle that every day, right? What I'm most concerned about is that we have different sectors in the charter sector. We have networks and we have individual schools. I think there's room for everyone. And we don't want one to dominate the other. We have to bring it back to the origins if chartering is going to succeed. We are going to hear from, oh, on mute again. We're going to hear from Amber Reichgott Young now. It's Mattress Firm semi annual sale, meaning your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> if you say, call mom. <laughs> Definitely did. 
All right. I uh, will need the clicker as well, and we'll just take you through some of the history here. Thank you so much. And uh, should I have the microphone to record? All right. Sounds good. Is that good? Are we good? Thank you. I am so pleased to be here. Thank you so much. There's some dear friends in the audience, and Peggy Lepic I served with, and uh, so thank you to the League of Women Voters, all of the leagues here, for taking time to learn about this issue and really become educated about an issue in which there's just a whole lot of information, but you're not exactly sure what to believe. So thank you, thank you for that. What I thought I'd do is take my 10 minutes to give you that fundamental history of chartering because I am the author of the first law, and it did occur right here in, in Minnesota in 1991. So let's see if this little guy works here. I'll take you through 26 years in 10 minutes. How's that? <laughs> First charter school was in uh, St. Paul, September 7th, 92, called City Academy, served students who had dropped out of school. But you know, you need to understand visually, I think, what 26 years is. Take a look at Nathan here. Nathan is a charter school teacher in Toledo, Ohio. And when I gave this story, he came up and he said, I was born in St. Paul, Minnesota in January of 1991, which was five months before the law was born. So you add three years to that, and that is how old chartering is in this country. And so you get a sense of why we still have some issues out there. It's very, very young. Now what happened back then was that ordinary citizens like you and me took an extraordinary stand for change. And that change resulted in this now around the country. 44 states have chartering. And it's even in Guam. You can see Guam down there, Hawaii and Alaska. And here are some of the statistics. Over 3 million students attending over 7,000 charter public schools. There are 44 states, DC, Guam, Alberta, Canada, Canada, and you won't believe this, but there are 10 public charter schools in the Kurdish region of Iraq. There you go. Uh, one million names are on waiting lists, and uh, those uh, in some states of New York, there are more names on waiting lists than there are spaces in charter public schools. Uh, two-thirds support from Americans, and I ask you what else two-thirds of Americans support. Now, I say until 2016 because in 2017, Cap and Gallup poll did not poll this question for some reason, even though it had been steady like that for five years. And I will say today, that might be changing only because people are getting charters and private schools mixed up with the Trump in, within the Trump administration. And so I'll come back to that in a second. How did it happen? Well, three visionaries came together. One was Governor Rudy Perpich, a Democrat. He proposed open enrollment to a firestorm of protests where a child could go to any public school they wanted in any district in the state. Um, he opened the door to chartering because once you had more access to choices, the question was, what if there were no, not many different choices to access? We needed more choices in the neighborhoods where children could attend and not have to go across town. The second visionary might surprise you. It's Al Shanker, the uh, president of the Federation, uh, the uh, National uh, American Federation of Teachers, and he came to, uh, to Minnesota to talk about charter schools. He wanted to create charter schools because he wanted to empower teachers. He wanted them to be the professionals that they are and have the autonomy to do what they do best, which was teach. And he said, at that time, he said, well, you know, the problem is that the districts can take their students for granted. And he was right, because there were no other options. Now, the third person, or the third group, the third visionary, was the Citizens League. That was a group of people from uh, education, from business, from uh, labor, from civic leaders, all coming together from outside the political system. And they were fleshing out what Al Shanker proposed. The thing is that chartering came from outside the political system. And I've always felt as an elected official that it's important to step back and remove the barriers and let others or citizens take the lead. And that's what happens in chartering. So why chartering? Well, this is it. It's to open up the K-12 public education system to allow groups other than the local school board to provide public education. And the key was outside of the current district so that there would be that, uh, um, that mobilization, if you will, that response. But Shanker disagreed with that. He wanted it within the system, and that's where we diverged in our views. So why chartering? And I said this in the video. It's a system redesign. It's about letting new innovation happen. It's about starting schools new. Chartering is not a school. So to make a comparison between a charter public school and a district public school academically or otherwise simply does not align with the original origins. 
The charter school bargain. In return for independence, charter school leaders commit to accountability in their performance contract. They have to live up to that contract or the school may be closed. And in that sense, they are actually more accountable than district schools. And I like to just say they trade regulation for results. Well, back to the story. The people in um, the legislature and all, we're not, uh, we're not all that, or the education establishment wasn't all that open to having all this change, and there was great opposition. Powerful teachers unions aligned against it, the DFL majorities in both houses, there were certainly opponents there, school boards didn't like it, and Governor Arnie Carlson, who had just been elected, a Republican also had been elected with the support of a union because the union didn't care for the open enrollment that Mr. Perpich had proposed. So that was the climate upon which chartering passed. In the end, it was a very, very vigorous, vigorous fight. Many, many strong opponents, but it did pass by three votes. And for me, it was a rather painful journey because I'm a Democrat and a union-endorsed Democrat, and my friends were on the other side of this. Um, and in fact, the lobbyist for the Minnesota Federation of Teachers was my ninth grade math teacher right here in Robbinsdale. <laughs> Why did it pass? Two reasons. One was because it was very much bipartisan. That's why I have a red donkey. And in the end, on the critical vote, 42% of the majority Democrats voted for it, 56% of the minority Republicans voted for it, and it passed by three votes. Now you say, how could that happen, that a minority of the majority party supported it and it passed? And that's because the Speaker of the House knew that sustainable long-term change needed to have a bipartisan coalition. Well, the second reason that it passed is because it was severely compromised to the point where I thought there would never, ever be a charter school. And so, um, really, I was surprised right after it passed that to learn that compromise was not defeat. And the reason is because Republican Senator David Dernberger and then Governor Bill Clinton, head of the Democratic Leadership Council, took this national immediately and said, look at this pragmatic third party choice, third party um, school choice. And they said, let's take this and, and see if we can build on this new idea of public school choice. Why? Because the public was demanding tradition shattering changes. And here's why. At the time, on the one hand, President George H.W. Bush was proposing private school vouchers. On the other hand, the House Democrats and Congress were saying status quo. And so this was a solution right down the middle. Checking on my time. How are, we, how are we doing? Two minutes left. All right, thank you. So, whoop. so coming back, however, back to Minnesota. Oh, this one doesn't go backwards. I remember. <laughs> well, that last slide was the fox guarding the chickens, right? Because what happened back in Minnesota, even after this national conversation was occurring, uh, my fears were realized because only the school districts could be the sponsors of charter schools, and that was that compromise. And the first seven of nine charter school applicants were denied, and the only two that made it through was City Academy, where Bill Clinton visited, and that was a school that served those who had dropped out. And then secondly, a special needs school called the Metro Deaf School. Well, that really was the reason why I could come back to the legislature and and uh, I think we're, we, that, there we go, and amend our law to allow more authorizers so that there was somebody other than the school district that could authorize it. And we have now a number of them, uh, higher education institutions and single purpose chartering boards that can authorize a charter school. And that's what provides that opportunity for more choice and more opportunity and a more robust charter sector. Now, one of those authorizers, the single purpose chartering board, is something that might surprise you. It is the first union-initiated charter school authorizer in the country. And our beloved Sandy Peterson, who had been an opponent of that in the legislature as a union leader, came back and became a leader of this first union-initiated charter school authorizer, along with Louise Sundin, president of the Minneapolis Federation of Teachers. And today they are authorizing over 20 charter public schools. So in the back of my book, uh, the probably the most read portion of my book is Louise Sundin's part of it. Call it saying coming, it's called coming full circle, coming from the opponents and where Al Shanker was all the way to now where they're actually authorizing charter schools. I do have a couple of books here if people want them. I, I'm not pushing books, but if you want them, I, can, I do have a discount. And with that, I think I was going to try to get to some of the myths, but maybe we'll get to those in the discussion. I will just do one myth, if I may, and end on this because it is the most important thing of my presentation, and that is this. The biggest myth right now about charter schools out there is that they are private schools. Over one 
third of America thinks they're private schools. They are actually public charter schools. And my question, my hope, is that when we talk about this in the panel and otherwise, that we talk about charter public schools and district public schools. Because too often I hear charter and public, and that is not the correct use of the language. And with that, I say thank you very, very much, because Peggy is telling me to stop. <laughs> Thank you so much. You may remain seated if you like. Yes, just speak. the microphones could all be working for everyone. Yeah. We'll next hear from Carrie Bakken. So my name is Carrie Bakken, and I am about, now that I've finished my 16th year of teaching in a charter school, so I have almost 20 years of teaching experience. Um, I was part of the founding teachers that were hired to run Avalon School, and in my experience in the beginning of the, um, working at Avalon, I, everything that it is out there about charter schools, Avalon is the opposite. So, so one thing that um, comes up is that at our school, teachers run the entire aspect of running the school. So we have a 95 to 100% teacher retention rate every single year, probably for the last 10 years, maybe even longer. And the reason is, is that we are con in control of how we educate our students. So the two most important parts of Avalon are that the student is very student learner centered. So we have project based learning is the core, the background of our uh, model and then um, and then teachers running the school. So that was part of the original vision of charter schools, which required that a majority of teachers sit on the school board. So, um, and that is still true at Avalon and it's still true in, in many charter schools around the state. So the idea was that teachers were being um, controlled maybe too much in certain, in certain situations and that if you use their talent, they could do more for students. And that's exactly what Avalon School is. So we also harness the talent of the students. So students decide hey, I'm really interested in this, and they can design projects in, in that topic, and then it's my job to connect it to standards. So they take all of the high school requirements and all of the state standards, and they can choose to take classes, or they can choose to do projects. And most students have um, a hybrid. You couldn't go to Avalon and take all the classes required to graduate because there's not enough of them, but you could go to Avalon and do only projects. Um, so, so when you see the young man in the video, and this was a couple years ago, he went to a Dinah Public Schools and he talked about how like, horrible that experience was for him because he um, has some needs and he's extraordinarily bright. And when he came to Avalon, the first major project he did as a ninth grader was build a Tesla coil. And he felt stupid all the way up until eighth grade. So it was a place for him to, to finally be validated in how he learns. And that's why we have such a high special ed population at Avalon. So many of the kids that walk through our doors, they were getting Fs before they even came to Avalon. And then we have a whole chunk of kids who are very gifted or, or maybe they're just unusual and they just don't fit in with the, the very traditional model <laughs> of kid. And, and they find this place where they can finally be themselves, be validated for who they are, and um, succeed. And so, so it's hard when you hear the negative publicity, because many of these kids would have continued on that path of not feeling successful. And so, um, so, so, so it's a very precious place, and you'll see, um, we just had a group of visitors, a national policy organization from DC, and they're looking at lots of, they're looking at traditional schools, they're lo traditional districts, and they're looking at charters, but they're really just looking to see what learner-centered um, an environment looks like. So they came to Avalon, and one of the people described the students as the land of the misfit toys, and it kind of is. It's these kids who just did not have a place in the traditional sector, and for a variety of um, reasons. So, um, so I think that piece is really powerful about the charter sector. I don't know if a school of 2,500 students can deliver that kind of personalization. And so being able to innovate and have that um, small setting for students is vital. So what has happened because it's been so personalized is our numbers of special education students has increased dramatically. So we're up to about 40%. Um, and the reason for that is that it's, it's really seamless. So 
So all students are together, all students have individual learning plans, and so a, a person isn't removed for part of their day. We do have small rooms and small math classes and things like that for students in special education, but, um, or some students, and, and I think it's really, I think a parent feels a lot of relief to see that it's mainstreamed and it's an inclusive environment for their students in special education, so that's a, a big part of our school. Um, I think if you take then um, what Avalon is doing, we are as best as we can trying to live up to the model. So we have done a lot of cross work with traditional districts. So many traditional districts come to our school and, and so if the, if the point of charter schools was, which I believe it was, to provide these little pockets of innovation so then they can try things out and see what works and then go back to the big districts so then they can also change practices that better informs our work with students, period. And that happens all the time at Avalon. So we've done projects with uh, Minnetonka Public Schools. We've done projects with Edison High School in Minneapolis last year. We've done, uh, we have this year we're finally tracking visitors, but we bring in pro hundreds of visitors from all across the country to look at just different ways to engage students. So I have very good relationships with some of the uh, Federation of, the Minneapolis Federation of Teachers, um, the St. Paul Federation of Teachers, the unions have been very interested in this model because we're part of a bigger group of teacher-run schools across the country. So this weekend is going to be a big retreat for uh, <clears throat> teacher-run schools across the country, and that has traditional districts, charters. And it doesn't matter which, where you're doing this work, but there is a lot of cross-collaboration. And I, that's my favorite part, that this is actually working and we're living up to the vision. How much time do I have? <laughs> Three minutes. <laughs> so, um, you don't have to speak the whole no, time. No, yeah. There'll I'm be plenty thinking, of time for questions yeah, and answers. I'm thinking about the myth and like how it's, um, and I think the other myth out there is that we take the best students since we're taking the best students out of the public sector. My kids are actually in Minneapolis public schools. I think there's lots of different choices that a family can make and you know, maybe I'll choose a charter for my daughter when she goes to high school, but, but I, I think we just, as we all know children in our lives, we all know that one model doesn't work for every single kid. And my two children are very, very different. And so I think we have to be really honest about that as a, as a community. Like what, what model works when you're trying to efficiently educate students, unfortunately the default is to do, make it more uniform. So. Thank you very it. much. Next we'll hear from Erica Stroll. Thank you. I am one of the parents on the panel. I'm the founder and chair of Agamim Classical Academy. <laughs> is that better? Yeah. Which um, is in Hopkins, Minnesota. And I thought I would tell you a little bit about Agamim and our academic program and then circle back to why I, as a parent, got involved in starting a charter school. Um, Agamim Classical Academy, when people hear the word classical, they sometimes think that we teach violin and, and cello, but um, what classical means is really a traditional liberal arts um, education. And for many people sitting in the room, it's probably like a lot like the education that you had in um, your elementary school experience if you were in a public school or even a parochial school. Um, Today, classical education is um, somewhat out of favor in district public schools, but it is very popular in the charter movement, and there's quite um, a it's quite a growth area in classical uh, in the charter school world. So, traditional liberal arts means that there's the students get a broad-based um, liberal arts education, math, reading, literature, spelling, oratory, grammar, penmanship, science, history, geology. For many of you, that, that probably sounds like what you had in um, elementary. If you have kids in elementary schools in a district public school today or grandkids, you may know that's not what they're receiving. Um, in most district public schools, the uh, curriculum, I think, has gotten very narrow and very um, focused on the state testing. That's what I saw as a parent. Um, 
we have we use something called the core knowledge um, sequence, which you can get at the library. Um, it's written by a person named E. D. Hirsch, who's a retired University of Virginia uh, professor. Um, I used his books to supplement my kids for many years. Um, and he really talks about what every kid in an American public school should know, what knowledge they should have in kindergarten, in first grade, in second grade. Um, when I first picked up the books and looked at them and compared what he was arguing all American kids should know and what my kids were receiving in their quite well-regarded district public school, it, it was quite overwhelming and um, very wanting. Um, public schools, the goal is to uh, provide um, competition, but you also, to get authorized, need to be doing something unique that is dis different than the district public schools in your area. So in addition to classical and core knowledge, which are not provided in district public schools around us, we have three pillars. Our pillars are classical American values, classical virtue, and classical languages. So for the American values, we talk a lot about liberty and e pluribus unum. Those are the particular um, values that we unite around. There's a big fo focus on American history, on civics. Um, we have a very diverse school and we focus a lot on what we have in common. Um, we wear uniforms as part of that EP EPU, as we call it, um, to show that we're very serious about school. We get dressed to come to school in the same way that adults might get dressed to come to work. Um, it also takes away some of the obvious um, income di disparity in the school in terms of what people are wearing. and. Um, Parents love the uniforms. That's one of their favorite things. Um, our classical virtues, there are many wonderful virtues, virtues in the world. We chose fortitude, gratitude, wisdom, joyfulness, and temperance. Mm -hmm. And our kindergartners can tell you what each of those words mean. Um, part of classical education is not only educating people who are very smart, but also people who are good. And part of classical education's goal, if you look back to ancient Greece, was to um, help develop engaged citizens for a free republic. And so we take that very seriously, that we are, um, our job is to develop students who are going to grow into engaged citizens in their community, and they're going to be knowledgeable and also good people. Um, for classical languages, we chose as our um, classical language modern Hebrew which is unusual. Most classical schools teach Greek and Latin. We do add Greek and Latin at the middle school years. A lot of people say, why Hebrew? Um, if you look back to the three civilizations that had the most influence on the founding of the United States, it would have been um, Greece, Rome, or Athens, Rome, and Jerusalem. And we chose modern Hebrew because it is a language that is still spoken. There are people in the community that speak it, and we can hire teachers. And um, our students can also talk to people or travel to Israel and um, learn them. And our students, 90% of our students have never seen a word of Hebrew before they walk in. And for some of them, Hebrew is their second or third or fourth language, and they just absorb it. Um, we, are, we opened as a K-4 school. We're in our, beginning our third year as a K-6, and we will grow to a K-8. Um, we're authorized to be a K-8, and parents are already asking us to think about um, the high school. We're one of about six or seven uh, charter public classical schools in the state, mostly in the metro. Um, we opened with 75 students, and um, our state reporting today showed 261 students. So we've grown very quickly. This is just our third year. Mm -hmm. We have students from 25 cities. We have a lot of kids who take the bus an hour each way to get to our school. Um, so their families are very serious about getting them here. We also have people driving in from Victoria, Columbia Heights, Shakopee, Maple Grove, Brooklyn Park. We're about 50-50 students of color and white students, about 15% special ed, about 15% ELL and about 30% free and reduced lunch, although I think some of those numbers will, will change as we get to know some of our new students and, and find out that some of them will need better ELL. Um, we have a parent majority board and we have a single purpose authorizer. 
So now going back, so why was I interested in starting a school? Um, I'm a St. Louis Park graduate. My husband's a St. Louis Park graduate. My mom is a retired Minneapolis teacher who uh, taught for 30 years um, English as a second language, as they called it when she was doing it. Um, I would say I was agnostic on charter schools. I, I knew as much as anybody else who tries to read the newspaper and keep up with with what's going on in their community. Um, we bought our house in St. Louis Park down the street from the elementary school and you know had a plan for our kids to go there and we're very excited about that. Um, and I don't wanna at all attack St. Louis Park because I, I think this is an issue across the board in, a, in many district um, public schools. I don't at all see it as particular to our district. Um, and my daughter may end up you know going Going back to the going back in the high school, I'm not sure. It's many years away, um, but I um, and there were many great teachers and many great families at our school, no doubt about that. What I saw was just a huge lack of content knowledge, um, a, a lot of focus on the state testing, a lot of focus on reading and math, um, without kind of a broad liberal arts um, education. Um, I saw a lot of focus on trying to bring kids who are far beyond, be behind up to the 50% mark, but not an equal focus on, on kids who could do more. Um, I was told a lot that my kids were doing fine um, and they were bored in school. Um, I was supplementing all summer and a lot of weeknights with the core knowledge curriculum. Um, and when I would come to school, and I was a very active parent, I was, I was definitely in the school every week, many hours a week. Um, I saw a lot of focus on working with students in small groups, um, which was great for the kids who were in small groups, but what I saw was the, the other 90% of the kids, they weren't being disruptive, but they were doing nothing. You know, They were daydreaming, they were doodling. So I just didn't see, um, I didn't find that my kids were being pushed to, to meet their potential. They were very bored. My daughter asked if she could um, drop out of kindergarten, which I didn't think was a great plan, workable plan for working forward. Um, so we were in an IB school that has a lot of big themes, um, but then different teachers do different pieces, and then there's gaps in knowledge depending on which teachers you have for which day. Um, am I at, I didn't look up, am I get close? One minute, okay. So um, so I got involved with a group of parents. We worked for four years. None of us had an education background. We didn't really know what we were doing a lot of the time, but we asked a lot of questions and we were able to um, start a charter school. Um, our school um, already has waiting lists and I personally, even though I was one of the founders, it has um, exceeded my expectations. Um, we hired a great executive director from a different uh, charter public school that's classical, and um, I will answer more questions later. Thank, Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from the traditional public, traditional public schools, and we'll hear first from the school board member, John Vento. Thank you. Um, again, my name is John Vento. I am serving my second term now with the Robbinsdale Area School Board, and as Jillian mentioned earlier, I am the vice chair of the school board. Um, also, just for some context, um, my experience over the last five years, I've been involved with the Association of Metropolitan School Districts, which is an advocacy group for the public education, the metro area. There's 49 members now. Um, I was the past chair last year. Um, I've also worked with MD up at e at the, on the ESSA advisory committee. So all of those lovely test standards and things that we sent into the federal government for our plans for the state accountability system, I was involved in um, with a, God, there's probably about 100 other participants through that process um, of working through that. So tonight, I want to just say right off the bat, charter schools are here to stay. They're not going away. Public schools are not anti-charter schools. It's, it's not an opponent-proponent. I think it's an issue from where I stand as a, an elected official of an equal playing field between education and what are we doing what's best for our children across the board. I have issues with choice just solely because choice is the problem what affects greatly the, the, mini, or the public school systems. I think the article that just came out, uh, was it this week or late last week in the Star Tribune talking about choice. And it's not charters in themselves, it's open enrollment, it's the public-private debate. 
how do we make the system work better together? I love the example I heard earlier about you know the, the Avalon works. Excuse me, is it Avalon? Mm -hmm. uh, working with some high schools, but at the state level, we do not have data sharing and data that is getting brought to the state from the charter schools to come back to the public schools. They're not they're not measuring the best practices of what they're and that was kind of the the idea behind them. Charter schools don't have to deal with the same statutes and rules public schools have to deal with. One of the challenges there is with funding, how do you equalize that? If they're, you know, I believe very strongly that, you know, we need to hold all schools to the same high standards, especially if they're receiving public <coughs> funds. Mm -hmm. um, that is something I'd love to see equalized. A lot of the issues aren't that I have, or their concerns, I should say, are with you know the dollar amounts because our funds are deteriorating are, are declining as you, you see as our districts are contracting with student population and competition when it is affecting the fact that we as a public school have to take every student that comes to our door no matter where they are at and you don't necessarily have parent choice when you're a homeless family you don't necessarily have parent choice if you're a single parent and your child has social emotional be in issues or mental health issues. Public schools today are, ask, are being asked to take on so much more than they were 20, 30 years ago. And I think charter schools are faced with some of the similar issues. One of the challenges, though, that public schools have is with transportation, we are required to, to do, transport students to the charter schools. A lot of the schools, or charter schools that choose to use that option, the school districts have to use their general fund movies, general funds, to subsidize those. So we wouldn't ask the charter necessarily to pay it, because that is, again, the state law says we have to transport the student, but the state isn't funding us fully to be able to do that subsidy over to the charter schools. When you come to special education, school districts are required to move to transport and pay for the special education services for their resident children that are going out to those charter schools. We've got a huge cross subsidy. And again, this is no fault to a charter organization, but it is at a statewide level where you create economic disparity. For the metro area back in 2015, it was a $28 million <laughs> general fund shortfall across about 40 districts here in the metro that we had to underwrite because the state and the federal government aren't meeting their obligation. Um, so those are some of the major concerns I've got overall there, and again, it isn't the fault of any one individual charter school. I know someone like Lionsgate is doing incredible work with autistic and special needs children. I've got a very good friend of mine, uh, Prodeo Academy, that is a new charter that just came online. He and I debate constantly. The wives hate it when we get together because we sit and talk, we go up to our corner and talk education. They're using a model out of New York of 90-90-10. 90% students of color, 90% free and reduced, bottom 10th percentile in test scores. And my one question to him is, how do I scale that in an elementary school? How do I scale that in my system that I have? I look at the volunteerism, the support they have, both from their authorizer and the community that they're bringing in. We don't have those resources anymore in the public school because of the break, you know, people with choice are moving those there. It's a reality. So I, I don't want to bemoan the point of you know, trying to level that playing field for public school. We compete with charters with magnet programs. We've got an immersion program, we've got C, and we now have the FAIR program. All of them have waiting lists to get into them, the same challenges a lot of charters are faced with. But I think there's a you know, greater societal issue that we view public schools as somehow failing. Anecdotally, the same way when the bad charters get, you know, John Day, or John, you know, it was John um, Oliver had a thing on uh, just recently on uh, charters, and they're talking about bad authorizers and lack of accountability system in Ohio and uh, and Florida, if I recall. We all get nicked with bad information, you know, or even as uh, as Ember pointed out about charters are not private schools. We don't want to lump them together. They are different. They are supposed to be the incubator for public schools. That was, I think, part of the intent of the original law. It, we need systems in place to make sure that encouraging that to happen to help the public schools. But again, 
the battle that we're faced with, 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 with school choice in itself, I don't want to bemoan or, or look at it negatively, but I think it does affect a community shared responsibility of supporting public education. In the state of Minnesota, our constitution says the child will have a, guarantees the child an education, and how is it equally funded? We, we've had, unfortunately, a little more lawsuits about it, and there's another one out there right now that districts are faced with. Um, how we are coping with the funding issue. And, and I think at the end of the day, whether it's a charter school or a traditional public school, it is, are we properly funding public education in the state of Minnesota? And that's where the bigger issue of the have, you know, where we see some of the challenges that come out of there. So um, lastly, I think one thing we also need to remember is 87% of the students in Minnesota are still coming to traditional public schools. Um, I think it's about 50,000, 50 some odd thousand are enrolled in charter. I know the vast majority of them are in the cities, but I do know there are a bunch in greater Minnesota. I think there's about 60 some plus thousand that are enrolling in, in uh, private, excuse me, in private schools. And there's about uh, 19,000 roughly that are being educated, homeschooled and whatnot. And the vast majority of students are still needing to be supported by the public school system. But again, I think we're faced with a lot of other issues that do affect us day in and day out, which you know I think ripple effect might affect the charters as it moves forward. So, um, and finally, I'd like to thank the league for hosting this event. I think it's gonna be a great conversation tonight. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Aisha Mustafa. John just said everything I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. So my name is Aisha Mustafa. I am a parent in the Robbinsdale district. I also work as an educational assistant in the special ed department with uh, behave, emotionally behavioral um, disorder kids who are very much marginalized, um, be it charter or public actually, um, more charter. But um, I am also the co-chair of the PTSO and the co-chair of the inner school council of Robbinsdale district. So I am a mom who wears many hats. Um, and in those hats, I come across a lot of the diversity and adversity, which uh, John just touched on. Um, I didn't want to piggyback on it, but I guess we need to <laughs> have to. Um, a lot of the points that he made with regard to um, public education, um, the funding that is a big issue right now, still leaving those of our children who are special ed marginalized um, and those, all of that fund looking for us looking, leaves us looking for where do we um, fill in the holes and the gaps in the public school system. Um, there's also the other part of diversity, which is another issue. Um, I feel that public schools offer the opportunity for the community members and stakeholders, uh, those who are a part of the community to have more say as to what goes on in a district if people would just involve themselves, which I do a lot of. <laughs> um, because I do want to have that say my children are in mm -hmm. Sonison school uh, as we speak so not only are they students of the same school where I work mm -hmm. I'm a parent not only to them but to every kid in the school and that is how I take my position very seriously especially as I pursue um, my licensure to become a teacher as well um, and with that being said I'm going to hand it over to Abby now All right. thank you Aisha Hi, thanks so much for having us. Um, as you can tell, we've had, even though this started with saying this is not like a pro-charter school event, we've had a history told by someone who started our charter schools in Minnesota and the nation. And then we've had, so we've had, spent most of the time really looking at charter schools and not looking at public schools. Um, and I am a public school advocate. I was a public school teacher for 15 years, and I'm at the University of Minnesota right now. I teach in issues in urban education um, and with people who are going to be English teachers. And so I have love for, like, Avalon and my friends who helped to co-found that, Nora Whalen, mm -hmm. and people who I know who teach there. And I understand what John's saying about can we use that as a hub and then what can it do to come back to the public schools? But the reality is that it hasn't. And the definition about charters not, charters being public schools actually was refuted by the Network for Public Education 
um, and it issued its position on charter schools and it said, by definition, a charter school is not a public school. Charter schools are formed when a private organization contracts with a government authorizer to open and run a school, like parents. Charters are managed by private boards, often, but not always, like the two here, right, and not always in Minnesota, um, with no connection to the community they serve. The boards of many leading charter chains are populated by billionaires who often live far away from the schools they govern, which we've seen in many states across the United States. So it's with that that Hillary Clinton said that charter schools don't take the hardest to teach kids, or if they do, they don't keep them, because there are policies that say things like, oh, well, we gave him this test, and really he should be in second grade, so he's going to have to repeat that. And then the parent's like, no, and then they take the kid out. So these are things that do happen with special ed, with um, low SES. Like, you know, Avalon has like 10 or 15 percent free and reduced lunch, which is really low. They have a, I mean, that's a pretty middle no, it's class. It's about 30 percent, 35, but it is. Oh, I got the numbers like class. two hours ago. Shoot. Okay. From but thank you. We'll have time for yeah. rebuttals later. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but point being, like, we have, a, there's inequities by race, by class by language, by ability. And if we do not get the funding to our public schools, and like John outlined, funding gets taken away by special ed, by title, by transportation, um, then we don't have that in our public schools. In my, in three blocks where I live, eight educators live there. All of the educators' kids go to Robbinsdale Public School. Every other white parent in the three block neighborhood goes to charter, private or Hopkins because we have developed a pathology around our public schools and what's there. It's, there's a reason why the NAACP created a moratorium on charter schools. So we, even though there are good things for some, small, some groups of kids, it's not scalable at this point and charters in the 20 years hasn't proven that it can be. So. To me, part of the danger is if people don't really look at the research on charters and don't just believe what charters say, right? Um, but beware of societal effects of segregation because we know that in Minnesota specifically, we have um, severely segregated charter schools. They destroy public infrastructure they destroy working conditions in schools, depending on, right? Not always. Not with teacher-led schools, there's some great things happening. But that is the danger and that is the issue. Um, they can promote real estate speculation about what happens, like, oh, what's your school, right? Where are you going? My kids, um, I have one kid at Noble and one kid at Fair Pilgrim Lake. So they're both in Robbinsdale too. Um, and then they generally overstate solutions to real problems. And we have problems in our society, which is why we have problems in our schools. And our schools are working really hard and our teachers are working really hard. But if we keep getting things like, not just money, but parents taken away from supporting our schools, then it's really hard to move forward. And if we do want to believe, like John Adams said, that we need to take um, the whole people must take themselves, take upon themselves the education of the whole people and be willing to bear the expenses of it. There should not be a district of one mile square without a school in it, not founded by a charitable individual, but maintained at the public expense of the people themselves. So I guess my question is, why public schools? What's the purpose of public schooling? What are the responsibilities of the school and what are the responsibilities of the public? Because that's what we have to make some decisions about. Um, and since we really haven't represented teachers in the schools, we're really lucky. We have Leticia Eddy here tonight, who's both a parent and a teacher of both charter and public schools. So just so that other people can hear on the mic, Leticia, can you come up so that you can share some? That would be awesome. Thank you. I just want to make sure that people in the 
viewing audience or recorded audience can hear. So, like Abigail said, I um, I have a I am a parent and I have a child that attended a charter school and the public school system. Um, I've also taught in charter schools and also in the public school system. Um, again, like John brought up, I have nothing against um, what you're doing with your charters. Um, I would like to bring up though that that um, there is a myth about public schools that, that we're always focused mm -hmm. mainly on kids passing tests. Mm -hmm. And that is far from it. We are trying to help build communities back up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anybody recalls, but I know a lot of uh, students in our urban communities, they kind of get left behind and forgotten about. They are uh, labeled, labeled and marginalized as just students of color. Mm -hmm. And they have a tendency to have no identity and their communities are dangerously breaking down. And we are working very, very hard so that they can have personalized learning mm -hmm. in their public school system. We are working very, very hard so that they can have someone and something to identify with and something to be relative to them so that they can have that growth mindset that mm -hmm. they can be graduates and do things um, that you all are doing in your charter school system. I also agree that there should be some kind of common ground with charter chartering and public school systems kind of working and piggybacking off of each other. Um, because um, there were areas where when my daughter was in charter school, it was great. And then there were areas when, when she was in public school, it was awesome. It was also great. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are now at the question answer period, and I do have some questions already. Um, I'll begin with the first one here. Do all charter school teachers have a four-year degree and are licensed by the state? So maybe that's for John Vento? On the charter side, that is one area that they're exempt, potentially, is charter schools are not, not all charter schools are required to have licensed teachers. Now, with that said, the state just approved a new licensing program, which leads to some other areas where now we can do a tiered licensure program where your, your community experts can come in. And I, I, and I know that the, the, you know, it's where the licensure is now. It's a four-year degree or a community expert. Public schools can bring them in. And I know some charter schools, and again, it, there are going to be examples on both sides where if I go to greater Minnesota, you're going to use more community experts because they don't, they can't draw teachers in, and part of the issue is because, was because of our existing licensure program. Um, today, we've got a new board that was I think constituted this week mm -hmm. um, by the governor for the teachers licensing, um, and I think we're going to see improvements there. And as long as the charters are using, you know, the, the fully licensed, but within that tiered system now, the four tiers. I think things will be fine. And I mean, that opens up pathways as like Aisha's saying, as EAs grow your own programs for districts. That will affect, I think, for public schools. And I think charters have been able to draw more people of color that look more like their student bodies based on the chartering and where the school's coming from, where, you know, the school districts, it's been tough to be able to recruit people to become public teachers because they, at you know, what was it the Report on America back in the late 70s really started the war on our teachers. And looking down on public, you know, on public the public education system, and I think that has discouraged a lot of people that would pursue it. We don't pay them well enough. All those, all the things we've heard about for years and years. Um, but I think with this licensure program, we have a chance to correct that for this in the state of Minnesota, and hopefully we can do more this session about encouraging more people of color to get involved. And, and just to be clear, Avalon and all charter schools have had to have licensed teachers since we opened in 2001 so i've always had to report that that and we have to do a star report that ties your license to the what you're teaching so every year we have to report that so i've never heard that we didn't have to have license yeah. it was required in the <laughs> yeah. original 1991 yeah. law yeah and again that could be the myths that are flying out it, there, it is it's actually are, number seven <laughs> well, no, those are, i mean that i think with both yeah, public schools right. and the, there are those things that fly back and forth where yeah. and you know it becomes the perception it was in my paper also they are licensed here uh, um can i can i can i just have a point of personal privilege yes. please so the last thing i said and i know i said it quickly but i just I just want to go back and uh, we um, 
this is a great conversation with a lot to agree and disagree on. But I've heard uh, multiple times exactly what I said before that is causing the confusion in this whole discussion. So let's use the proper language going forward, if I may ask. Charter and district schools, not charter and public. I've heard it multiple times from multiple speakers. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do that, we're all going to be confused and the public will be confused. But charter, public, and district public are the proper terminology. We can disagree. But if you say charter and public, you're inferring that charters are private. And I've heard the media say that. And I am a one-woman band on correcting the media. And so I just really wanted to do the same here. Thank, Thank you. you. My paper had um, charters and traditional public schools. That's, That's all right, also too. That's charter and traditional term. public. Is That can replace district. Yes. But it's not charter and public. No. And you can understand why. That would be right. A Charter problem. schools are actually their own school district. Right. That is correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I have another question since Amber Reichgott Young was just speaking. <laughs> we have a question here. The slide presentation stated teacher accountability is very high in charter schools, almost suggest suggesting there is low accountability in public schools. With that said, how do you justify the lower reading scores in a large proportion of charter schools? Many, many reading scores were lower than the expected scores the school had for students as published in the Star Tribune and printed in my presentation. When I talk about the policy and the accountability, that is a component of how charters are di different from district schools in the sense that they are held accountable to certain performance contract agreements with their authorizer. And if they don't live up to those accountabilities, they may be closed. In other words, charter schools, this, this school could actually Absolutely. be closed by an authorizer if they don't meet what they said they were going to meet on the reading levels that they negotiated and set. Whereas in district schools, that is not the same thing. They have no contract that they're held accountable for. Now, why are some schools lower than others as far as scores? Well, so are district schools. but. The real issue here is what can we do to bring, and I want to bring you back to what John said, what can we do to learn from each other what's working, right? Mm -hmm. You see, when I go out there as a Democrat to talk about chartering, I'm talking about what do we have in common and what do we all aspire to? And we aspire to 21st century education. All of us do. So can we get personalized learning? Can we get teacher-led schools, project-based learning? What can we do that works? That's what's important, whether it be district or charter, because they both have high scoring schools and they both have low scoring schools. Let's figure out what works, share it, and make it happen so that kids learn. That's kind of where I come from in all of this. Is there a public school representative who would like to speak to that? Whether public school. Do you mean a district school representative? Dis <laughs> district, public, traditional public school. Yeah. Not traditional. Not traditional. Yes. No. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to correct the language too. We mm -hmm. are not, I know for a fact, mm -hmm. I work for Sinus in School. Right now, I am an academic interventionist, and we are so far from mm -hmm. from traditional, it's unreal. I've never, <laughs> worked, I've never worked for a traditional but you're a district public school. school. <laughs> but we are a district school, okay, yes. Good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And, and teachers do have plans. They have to be accountable. The school is accountable. It, it, it's not like... But they won't it, be closed. It has changed a lot since No Child Left Behind. Public schools will close schools based on enrollment, not on performance. Yeah, true. And I think there's, there, there, there's you know, people will leave districts. There's a reason, you know, if you look back at the data, and I think the article, again, in the Star Tribune showed, you know, where Minnetonka schools were, you know, 10 years ago. Or ten or yeah, ten or twelve years ago, where they were looking at possibly closing, so it was either invest in and recruit people from other school, other districts, or save the save the school. And all of it, choice has opened that door up. And and, and, char, and charter schools with district schools are battling that constantly, where we're we're fighting for the kids to come to the schools. And I think we lose something in education when we're doing that because it does diminish the opportunities. It does diminish potential innovation, but it, it is what it is, and that's where I've got. That's where my concerns lie in, mm -hmm. in, in, in the the process is because it's not that one school is better than the other. If one district is so much better, why are they losing more students to another district? Can 
Can I comment on that? Because I live in North Minneapolis, and I would say Robbinsdale actually gets a lot of kids yep. from North. Absolutely. North you guys Absolutely. really Absolutely. do. And, and I grew up in the Robbinsdale School District also. But yeah. I, I just think that's a huge piece. I mean, if, if I look at um, my neighborhood in particular, maybe a few are in charter schools, but most of them are exiting to go to other suburban schools. And, and Robbinsdale's a huge winner in that. The, I think something very, we're, we're a winner, but we are also losing more students out of our district than we're bringing in. To yeah. other so, to other districts, to, yeah, so, yeah. 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 not necessarily to charter. Yeah. And it's yeah. and, it, and you can call it white flight, however it is. Mm -hmm. I think the one article two weeks ago in the Star Tribune was very enlightening when they were sharing that the number of students of color that are leaving. That's right, right. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And Definitely. one of the questions I went back to my superintendent about was, how many students of color are we losing? That's what was the answer? answer? Don't have the data yet, because <laughs> this was I mean that was that day. And where are we losing and identifying it? Because you generally, you know, it is generally involved parents that are leaving. School choice, you know, I, I think at times can be a detriment. And I think some of the information that Marty pulled together was great showing um, the credo information that if you stay in a system, whether it's traditional district or the charter district, if you're in the system, you're going to probably most likely be more successful. But if you're going from school to school to school to school, mm -hmm. those children are never going to catch up. Mm -hmm. So therein lies one of the challenges of choice. I didn't get what I thought I was going to get at this school. I'm going to go to that school. I didn't get, oh, that's not meeting my child's need. Now I'm going to pull them and go over here. I've known families that three different schools in three different years. Mm -hmm. And then they're complaining their child's behind. And I'm, it's. But rather than growing our community, community. and school advocates yep. exactly. and working as a community, which we could do. Now, long about way of the question, though, is the state does have a teacher accountability system that was implemented. We are doing it. We are using the tools, working with the union <coughs> to make sure we are making sure our teachers get the help they need and that they're not on isolated islands. The responsibility comes from the board, superintendent, the building leaders, and our administration to the teachers and their, PL, their personal learning communities to be able to bring them up. So we've got systems in place. You just got to make sure we follow the rules. Thank you. We have another question here. Do charter schools have to follow the ESSA rules? Mm -hmm. That's the every student succeeds. So mm -hmm. who would yes. like to take this one first? Yeah. We, we have to follow all the same state rules and regulations in terms of um, student success. And in fact, I just sent a notice out to parents for the world's best workforce um, requirements, which are um, closing the achievement gap, all reader or all third graders reading, um, college and career ready, prepared for kindergarten. They don't all necessarily quite apply to every school if you don't have a high school. However, we have to write we have to write a report to the state like every other what? district public saying how are we gonna meet these five five goals. So yes. Thank you. Yeah, I would concur. Sitting on the committee, there were, as I said, on the ESSA advisory there, I'd say at least 30 to 40 percent of the people participating were charter folks from that side, whether they be authorizers or mm -hmm. from the districts mm -hmm. or from advocacy groups there. The one caveat I want to throw on that, because you, again, in your background information, Marty, you pointed out opting out. So one thing people need to understand with ESSA is there's a federal requirement now that if you have more than 5%, that all counts as zero, that you the school will be affected with, and then they want to tie it to federal funding and all those things. Opting out of state testing. Out of state testing, correct. Um, and I know both, you know, there's been a large movement in both Minneapolis, sometimes Hopkins, and based on that data. So the, 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 the sword cuts both ways on that. Yes, they have to accountability, but we also have to make sure that those students are participating, whether you you know, that's a whole other discussion for the lead to bring up Ryan's <laughs> testing. testing yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Another question. Don't magnet schools have the same effect as charter schools on non-magnet schools within the district? Can Thank you, me. so another, let's see. Don't magnet schools have the same effect as charter schools, as non-magnet schools within the district? In other words, students yeah, yeah. leave their neighborhood school to go to a magnet school. Mm -hmm. And it attracts certain, um, in fact, in my district, we have a magnet school that I very intentionally never lotteried my kids for because 
the demographics looked really different than our neighborhood school, and I really wanted my kids in a diverse school. And I do think, I don't know if it's true in Robbinsdale, but a lot of the districts, the, mag the magnets, they attract um, a certain group of motivated parents. I think and they any, not kids that are high tra transition that are moving in and out. And if it's language immersion, you can't move in after year two or three. Right. So ability to test in. So we some yeah. There are waiting lists, and they do affect it. And as with a, whether it be a charter school or a district magnet program, um, I think they draw on those parents either way because mm -hmm. I know parents that do not get into the magnet programs and then they're either going to a charter that meets the mm -hmm. specific mm -hmm. you know, language requirement or they open an enroll to the other district. Or they move. Are they, or, well, then there's the, there, there is that factor that can come in. I think with open enrollment, you don't see as much of that um, moving there, but it is the involved parent. And I think we as a community, whether it's Robbinsdale's community, Golden Valley, Minneapolis, or wherever we've, and I think to Abigail's point is it, it is there. It is affecting the foundation of communities, and there is how do you find balance between choice? Because again, we're not going to put the genie back in the bottle. It's not like we're going to hit rewind and go back to the traditional model, which the majority of people here. I don't want to guess, but you know, when I grew up on the east side of St. Paul, I had the public school, I had the Catholic school, and you know, Crete and Durham and the private schools were some make-believe land down outside of this in St. Paul. That was our choices, and my dad was public school teacher in Minneapolis, and we were going to the public school, but that was the only choice we had. I think also that I think we lose sight on, and again, I'm going to talk a more philosophical level here, public schools are created to create factory workers. The bell systems going in through the uniformity of the system was from Germany, and if you really follow the history of it, it was designed to create workers. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of factories anymore in this country. But, so how do you, how do we, and Amber hit it right on that, how do we create that 21st century using models that were tied back to, mm -hmm. that were designed mm -hmm. to create factory workers? And that, I think, is that pulling factor, because you get accountability and all those factors that roll into this. That we, you, and, and we've got, you know, when I'm a politician too, so we, we've got this idea that we've got to hold on to what was. And how do we move forward? And that, I think, is a conflict. You know, I think there's <coughs> things happening within the district schools that are going to hopefully affect that in the next year or two that are coming out. Did I say something that I just that hasn't come in? You know, pe I've heard people talk a lot about how charter schools are impacting and maybe hurting the district public schools. Um, but I think that charter schools provide kind of a relief valve, as does open enrollment. And I believe that if we didn't have that, that we would have vouchers very soon. And I personally am not a vouchers supporter. Um, I think that um, a, there, I know a lot of people that if charter schools and open enrollment were not um, an option, they would be in private schools, they would be in religious schools, I would be homeschooling. I know that's not an option for everybody. But um, if you can't keep a solid base of Americans um, engaged in public education and charter schools is one way to do that. We will have vouchers, and I think that public education is a basic building block of American democracy, and I think that vouchers would certainly do everything that that is in opposition to what I wanted when I was starting Agamim, because it will, it will segregate and um, pull apart people by race and religion and ethnic group and um, I think We're already it's very dangerous. Though. I mean, that's what that's that's how we live. That's how our schools are. That's how charters have proven to be in Minnesota and the nation. So that's not how have they proven to be. I'm sorry. Segregated. My school is my our school is we worked very hard, and our school is not segregated. proven to be what I just well, want clarification. Segregated. Segregated. Oh, that's another issue. Okay, can, right. can I just? Have yeah, a we have a question here. Let me ask the question. <laughs> All, right. All right. Speak to the fact that many or most charter schools have segregated by race. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our school is an, our school is very diverse, and we worked very hard in terms of going into the community and telling people about the program we were offering and asking them if they were interested and asking people if they would like to come. Um, I will also say that I know there are many charter schools in, in particularly in Minneapolis and St. Paul that are very racially segregated, um, but it, 
I think there's something interesting about saying that families of color can't do the same thing that white families have been doing for 25 years by moving out to the suburbs oh. or whatever. And, I, and families that I have talked to and teachers that I have talked to at a lot of schools, the families have chosen that school and they are very happy with it. And it seems to me that if that's the program they want to choose, yep. they should be able to do it. So happy is if one I may, thing. I don't have yes, yes. a chance here. And yes. I've got are you going to respond to her or is something else? Two things. Yeah. No, are you going to respond yes, to I what will. she said? Yes, I will. Second thing, yes. Yeah, let, let her okay, go first. Go ahead. Well, go. if you want to go ahead, that's all right. Go ahead. I just wanted to make sure before we ran out yes. of time. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we were responding to her. Go ahead, so, please. That's fine. Um, in regards to like trying to diversify a school, and having 25, 30% black students at your school, about 15% Asian and over half white. Um, in a classical curriculum, we know based on education research for at least the two decades that Gloria Letts and Billings has been around, that the curriculum at classical academies and Ed Hirsch, who you named, is steeped in white supremacist Eurocentric curriculum. And it is dangerous for students of color to be taught that there are three main groups who formed this country without reverence to the backs and the blood of the black and brown people who did form this country. And so it is dangerous. And we don't know yet because some of the classical academies are newer and are newly welcoming in diverse populations of students. And we don't yet know um, that that will work because what we do know are the test scores, which are still predictable by race. We, we have work to do, um, as the district publics do, on um, closing the achievement gap. I would say that I, I did not, I said the three civilizations that influenced the founding of the United States. And I will also say that my daughter has learned, has had a more diverse education in um, history, in terms of the literature they read, the poetry they learn, than she had in her district public school, by far. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm familiar, very familiar with the curriculum that's at the classical schools. Thank you. No. You get to speak. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm glad that you answered because I couldn't have answered that one, so you're right. Um, so two things. One is uh, starting with what you were saying about choice. Part of the reason we offered chartering back in 91 is to offer more choices for parents because parents wanted choices. So it is about public school choice, not private school choice. Like you, I don't support vouchers. So that's where I was, this is that center public school choice and the more opportunities mm -hmm. that parents can have, I think the better to choose what fits their child because, you know, the way I look at it, you've seen one charter school, you've seen one charter school. They're very different, and the needs of children are equally different. Um, and so that that piece about the opportunity, when they pulled that um, and asked parents, I think in 2014, uh, across the country, what the number one thing they wanted to see an improvement in education, 60% responded more opportunities, and that's more choices. So when we talk about choices, we're talking about something parents really value. Second thing then that ties into the segregated issue. Okay. Um, so today you do have some schools that are like 98% Somali, 98% African American. Parents are choosing them. Why are they choosing them? Because in one case, Friendship Academy for the Arts, it is a national blue ribbon school. It's a beat the odds school. It's huge free and reduced lunch numbers and they're doing very well. But Parents are choosing that. Mm -hmm. And that's different than the segregation of the 60s and 70s, where the government told them where they needed to go or could go. And so to me, it's a very different situation. Should we definitely do outreach for inclusion and all that? Yes, absolutely. But if you believe in parental choice, which is the underpinnings of public open enrollment and public school choice, I would hate to tell the, ch the, the parents of those children at Friendship Academy that they're forced to go somewhere else because that, I mean, that, that isn't that what we were doing back in the 60s. And that's basically what that would entail. All right, we're getting towards the end here. I want to ask a question, couple of 
we have about three more questions. Why do you think some of the innovations used in charter schools are or cannot be done in a traditional public school setting? I think they can be. Um, so I think one thing that I've learned in, in learning about a lot of teacher-run schools across the country is they are more innovative. And, and I think that the reason, I mean, I live in North Minneapolis. I picked Minneapolis public schools. And there have been times in the, my career of my students' kids, I mean, my kids, they're in their career and their academic career. I've been really disappointed because it was this kind of factory. They really got down to this thing called focused instruction. And there was one point where my kids were in a class and the principal would come in and watch the teacher for five minute increments and are you on that focused mm -hmm. instruction? And, and that was a really yucky model. And I mm -hmm. think they're getting away from that, but they need to be pushed to get away from that. Um, yeah. And I, I care very deeply about Minneapolis public schools and I live in North and I, Everybody goes all over the place. They, very few are in the neighborhood school, and they mostly go to the suburbs, in different suburbs. Um, and I kind of miss that, like everybody goes to the same school and you all, <laughs> you know. You're, and so I, I, have a, I, I can't speak about this whole situation as good or bad. I just know I couldn't do what I do with students in a big traditional school because you get a new principal and it's gone like that. Mm -hmm. You get a new superintendent, it's gone like that. You get a new school board, it's gone. So with us, we get to keep this model going for 16 years. We're in charge. I know my students well. I know what they can do. And I think that's been the burnout with teachers is that you might get to do this really, really cool thing, but for how long? before the next principal comes in and says, oh, sorry, we're not doing that anymore. And that's what I hear in the traditional setting, even in Robbinsdale. Robbinsdale teachers will say it, Minneapolis teachers will say it, and that's what they're teaching under. And I, I think, think that's the depends, difference. Though, right? It depends, depends on the school. I mean, I, I can call. I'm a Robbinsdale teacher, teacher yeah. and I can't say that. I couldn't say that for no. Minneapolis. I didn't do that last year, I've got and I'm like not a, doing that now. Yeah, yeah. All, of like class, mom, all of my class, all of my class instruction have been project-based, personalized learning, and innovation. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I just, I've heard from teachers who've taught for 20 years that, like, yes, it mattered who the principal was, sure. who was able to do it, sure. yeah. period. So. And that's what I would love to see is more of that. Yeah. And where we can learn. Because if you bring the autonomy into the uh, district schools, and the unions sometimes try to negotiate for that, and that's how we can create some of those things in the district. I am a proud graduate of Robbinsdale High School <laughs> and the Robbinsdale schools. And when we created this in 91, it was to just provide more opportunities for those whose needs weren't being met. And today, only 7% of the students in Minnesota go or attend to a charter public school. So it's a very small number, really, in comparison to all of the student uh, schools. But it is 100% of opportunity. Thank you. OK, here's another one. What do you think um, public and charter schools can learn from each other? Mm. <coughs> I mean, every time I work with another district in it, in a, um, so Minnetonka had a business program, Edison mm -hmm. starting the business program, and so our kids have done collaborative projects. Um, and we even did a collaborative project with a private school. Every, even, so I do see not great stuff happening in some charters, to be honest. So Avalon mm -hmm. has been able to work with some mm -hmm. charter schools, and, and that's frustrating, it's hard to watch, and, um, mm -hmm. But I learn every single time I walk into any single school, period, from the teachers, from the students, whatever. But every, I can, you can always find something that's happening better somewhere else. OK. Mm -hmm. Another one here. What are the charter schools doing to engage all parent involvement? Same question for public traditional. Do they see this reflecting school yeah. test scores? <laughs> Good. We ask parents to um, volunteer 10 hours a year and there's a variety of ways they can do it from home, coming into school, helping at outreach fairs. Um, we're having a kindness chalking day on Monday so they can come at 8 o'clock and chalk the board. So um, we don't, we don't, uh, we just ask people to, to do it and we give lots of opportunities. We don't track it or there's no negative response if you don't do it, but we ask it and we get it from most parents. Uh, we don't have a negative response, um, but however, we do have a lot of activities um, in our meetings. Uh, we're pretty intentional with regard to talking and speaking to parents. Um, for our PTSO, 
which we have a lot of um, participation. We also have an app that we have now introduced, and we, we were really bent on kind of introducing that to the school, to the teachers, or at least to the parents, giving them the opportunity to be able to link up with other parents, have conversations, um, and get in the know of what's going on at the school. So everything Sonison can be found on an app, which is loaded on the phone. If you want to talk to me, the PTSO co-chair, or any activities that are going on, you're welcome. We also are intentional about um, get asking for a volunteer. Um, we, all, we had a ton of volunteers at our last PTO, PTSO meeting uh, where people were saying, yes, I want to volunteer, or how do I sign up? and immediately started to download the app and I was on my computer literally loading um, parents on. The same with um, Interschool Council where we have our conversations about what works um, to get parents involved and a lot of that also has to do with the understanding of knowing um, the parents that you are dealing with and that diversity does not just include uh, ethnicity, it doesn't just include um, the people's cultural makeup, it also includes, you know, their lifestyle. You have parents that work from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., mm -hmm. and maybe they can't do specific activities, but if you schedule it for a certain day where they're off, mm -hmm. then you're able to get those parents to come in and participate. Mm -hmm. So it's more of an understanding and, and just being a parent and kind of getting to know those you work with or spend time around. We've also incorporated a couple of more programs, at least this year. Um, we've, we're offering um, homeschooling. I'm not homeschooling, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> home visits mm -hmm. um, to make it more convenient for parents, especially those that don't live within the community mm -hmm. itself, but mm -hmm. you know, are open and road. We also um, are opening a literacy program for after school where we are like mandatorily having parents come in and saying, you're saying you can't help your kids at home. Well, let us help your kids in front of you and then give you the skills so that you can help your kids at home. Um, we keep an open line of communication with parents. Again, we have a very active PTSO uh, group that keeps um, the parents involved. And we also have um, plenty of activities throughout the year where we invite the community, not just our parents, but also the community itself that, is, that the school lies in to, to come and um, talk with each other. There was one last question. I'm, I'll just ask for John Bento because it is about a person whose son and daughter-in-law were trying to find a building for their uh, for a Spanish immersion charter in Hopkins, and they wanted to know why is it that empty public schools are not available for the public charter schools? I can answer that. Oh, well, I Could can you? answer it because too. Because we asked because St. Louis Park that, and they said because we don't want you here because you are our competition. Oh. Okay. Yes, and I would we when we put. <laughs> And I was not on the board at the time, but when we sold um, Winnetka Heights, the location up on Winnetka and um, up by Bass Lake, there was a condition on the sale that it would not be sold to a charter school. Mm -hmm. well. And that, again, it's the effect that charters can have on the budgets and everything within a district. Um, it, it is powerful. And it, it, because you don't, and I think one of the challenges with this whole situation is because you don't have. They're, they're not working together, and, and and I think legislatively, there's you know how can they fix how can we fix it? Because at the state level, we're really good about putting a lot of good rules out there, but without funding them, mm -hmm. and without really taking them away when they don't work. So it, it, they kind of get stuck out there. And one, I, I want to give one shout out though um, with the legislation that we do have in our state right now, kind of alluding to what Abigail was talking about about the national providers for charters. We do not permit permit mm -hmm. for profit charters That's in right, Minnesota, which, is great. Yeah. which mm -hmm. I think is a tremendous it reason is. why we have not had as many horror stories and some of those things as mm -hmm. these national charters where they're coming in trying to crush the per, per, how much it's costing to educate a child and making yeah. profits off it. Um, so there are some things like that that we're mm -hmm. doing, I think, very well in Minnesota, um, and I think you know, when, in the conversation I've heard, you know, whether it's vouchers or whatnot, I think when you bring a profit motive mm -hmm. to education. Somebody loses. Someone is going to lose out big time. Mm -hmm. And so thankfully, we've not been there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'll give the state credit there. And also the corrections, I think it was 09, 08. And there were some of the issues that were coming up with some of the authorizers. Mm -hmm. And we've been very good about monitoring yeah. it from that side.
Thank you so much. Just add this one is thing just, that facilities is a big issue for charters regardless, is. and that's because they do receive on average about 30% less of the general funding uh, for their school than the district. And they they can't we also own get buildings. startup money too yeah. So yeah, we can't. from the federal government. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't own we're your gonna, building. We're going to see, we're going to have to end the conversation right now, but as you can see, I think the conversation <laughs> is just beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much yeah. to all of the panelists here, and thank you also thank you. for the teacher. <laughs> Thank you.